really glad that I can be here and thank you very much for Sefepra for organizing this talk today. So what I'm going to be speaking about today is Afghan debates on ransom <coughs> excuse me, war prisoners during the 19th century jihad era in West Africa. And it's mostly based on work that I did for my book, Ransoming Prisoners in Pre-Colonial Muslim Western Africa. And just um, and ransoming is intimately linked to enslavement. And the reason why we can have to talk about debates on slavery with debates on ransoming is because 90% of the people who were enslaved in Africa were enslaved through warfare. However, there were other things to do with war prisoners than to enslave them. So a lot of the literature has been focused on enslavement as a result of captivity, but other options for dealing with a war prisoner um, is to kill the war prisoner, exchange the war prisoner, release the war prisoner, and or ransom the war prisoner. So what I'm focused on is the ransoming of war prisoners. And just to let you know that in terms of enslavement, the way that people were enslaved, 90% were enslaved through warfare, but then in descending order, other ways to be enslaved were through raids, banditry, kidnapping, which is obviously illegal in all jurisdic jurisdictions, judicial and punishment, which is illegal in under Islamic law, but in non-Muslim societies it was often a fate for um, serious crimes such as murder or rape. Um, also there was voluntary enslavement, which is also illegal um, in Muslim regions, but where you saw that in non-Muslim regions where literally the choice is between starvation or selling yourself into slavery. Some individuals chose to sell themselves into slavery, other people would choose um, to die. So um, my focus then is on what happens to these war prisoners um, after they're taken captive. The other thing that I want to make clear is the definition of what I'm talking about. So. Uh, there's oftentimes um, confusion between the ransoming of, between ransoming and redemption, and oftentimes in the literature, both in the English language literature and also in the French language literature, the terms ransom and redemption are used interchangeably to refer to what I refer to as redemption of slaves. So I'm talking about what happens to captives prior to the decision being made about their fate. Um, for, and so what I refer to ransoming of captives or of war prisoners when um, this person is taken captive, they're being held, and money in either well, cash or kind is exchanged in order for, and this person is able to return home to the previous social position and life goes on. Whereas I refer to redemption of a slave um, is when an um, enslaved person or a person on their behalf pays money for the release of that person from enslavement, but that person is usually held in, still remains in the society in which they were enslaved, usually in a subservient position. So um, you see that oftentimes ransoming and redemption of M or Pasha or Hanson are kind of used interchange interchangeably to refer to redemption of slaves. I want to make sure that I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about um, ransoming of, um, of war, war prisoners. And the other thing that I make a differentiation between is that often the question comes up, how do you tell uh, between a short-term slave and a long-term captive? And again, to me, it's about what happens to that person afterwards. If this person's able to return home to their, to their own society with a previous social position and kind of recover from a traumatic experience, then what happened was that was a ransom of, of a captive. If that person is staying in this new society in a subservient position, then that was a redemption of a slave. Okay. Um, so, in looking at the ransoming practices and discourses, um, obviously understanding ransoming, I think, uh, and the impact that it had on African societies uh, um, is important in a, on in, in on itself. However, what you also see is that um, looking at ransoming and how the debates on ransoming 
and the grassroots practices, it also provides a lens into some larger questions that was going on in society. So for example, who was and was not a Muslim? How should and could Islamic law be implemented in their societies? What rights and protections should recognized free Muslims have? And what role should government have in ensuring those rights? Um, especially in an era when slavery was legal. Um, and it also provides insight into broader African ideas on slavery, freedom, religion, and ethnic identity within African societies. Um, also, by looking at intellectual debates on ransoming and enslavement, um, this uh, is a further demonstration of intellectual exchange and transmission of ideas, and therefore is a contribution to intellectual history of West Africa. And also, the debates and practices of ransoming um, and who got ransomed and who is not ransomed affected who ended up in both the transatlantic and the trans, um, um, trans-Saharan slave trade and therefore affected formation of culture both in the Americas and in North Africa and beyond. So what I am looking at primarily is these debates and practices of ransoming within what's the West African Jihad era. And so the West African Jihads are referring to a series of reform movements or revolutions that are called by different names um, that started in the 1670s in the Senegal River Valley and went on until the mid-19th century um, with the Marian revolutions in what's now Mali and some people will include Samari Ture's um, movement in southern Mali as part of these revolutions also. Um, and there's been a series of different arguments about what these were. Okay, so at different times they have been interpreted by as ethnic movements. Most of these movements, the leadership has been Fulani or Pearl, um, in in French. However, when you actually take a look at uh, the, the leadership is actually, and who joined these movements is actually a multi-ethnic movement. Um, they have been interpreted as religious movements and so really focusing on the religious nature of, and the and imposition of, an, of a new interpretation of, of um, Islam onto these societies. However, most of these movements took place in societies that were already considered to be Muslim. Um, they've been also been interpreted as urban versus rural movements. Most of the people who took part in these movements came from more rural areas um, and, get, and overthrowing governments that were based in more urban areas. Um, and more recently, they've also been interpreted as part of the Atlantic revolutions. Um, my PhD supervisor, Paul Lovejoy, just put out a book a few years ago where he argues that these should be considered as part of the Atlantic Revolution, so included in the series of revolutions that include um, the American Revolution, French Revolution, Haitian Revolution, and the Spanish, Spanish American Revolutions. I wouldn't go quite as far as he does um, in that argument. I, would, I do agree that African ideas on enslavement and on and on proper running of society that had an impact on on societies in the Americas and the, and African ideas especially had impacts on the Spanish American revolutions. However, the Atlantic revolutions and the ideas being fomented in Europe and in the Americas did not have an impact on what was going on in Africa. Did not have an impact on what we consider to be these um, jihads. I view them most. I agree mostly with the argument that these are primarily anti-slavery movements. Um, if you go back to the first one, Nasser al-Din's movement in the, in the Senegal River Valley, uh, the, this movement took place in an, er, in an area where there has been a debate about whether or not um, taking captives was a byproduct of warfare that was happening anyways, versus uh, wars that were conducted primarily to get slaves. So in most of Africa, and certainly most of West Africa, um, captives were a byproduct of wars that happened for the usual reasons why warfare happened. And then what do you do with a captive, right? Kill them, let them go, exchange them, release them, ransom them, um, enslave them. Um, in the Senegal River Valley, there's um, a lot of debate about um, sort of wars that were, because there was 
the selling of slaves into the transatlantic slave trade was so lucrative that that there was actually raids and slave and enslavement and warfare going on just to take take people captive. So it's not surprising then that a movement um, that an anti-slavery movement would start there. Um, and when and when you look at the main complaints of the leadership of these movements, whether you're talking about the Senegambia region or the Central Sudan region, um, where the Scholar Caliphate is going to be established, then one of the main complaints has been that these Muslim governments were not doing enough to protect um, residents, other freeborn Muslims, from enslavement, and that this was the role of a Muslim leader, was to protect um, freeborn Muslims from, from enslavement. And so I put more weight on the anti-slavery movement aspect of it. Um, what we do know is that these new states, um, these movements, uh, result in new state formations based on the Maliki School of Law, which was a school of law that's preponderant in West Africa, and mostly on the Qadiriya um, Sufi Brotherhood. Um, the one exception is Umar Tal, who was the leader of the Tijaniya in West Africa, and he's going to establish um, his state based on interpretation of the Maliki School of Law, along with, with Tijaniya thought. Um, but again, um, looking at these broader questions, when I'm looking at these jihad movements, what I see, and these are still questions that are asked today, so even when you're looking at modern day insurgencies that are going on in the Sahel region, the fundamental questions are, um, who is a Muslim, um, which interpretation of Islam should dominate, what is the role of Islam in the state, and who gets to decide? So these to me are, are the bigger questions that um, were being um, asked and answered in different ways um, in throughout these movements. So, any questions so far? <laughs> Stop and ask questions, or should we save them for the end? I have some, uh, not questions, but wondering <coughs> about the Qadiriya and the Tijaniya and trying to make connections, um, like uh, the type of links or the relations that they would have in the so I guess in Morocco, Algeria, right? Um, so, so the Qadiriya was well established in West Africa since the 1500s. And then what you have is, um, especially with, with Timbuktu, um, what, what you have is, is through, through Timbuktu, they have the spread of Qadiriya education and leadership in, Qadiriya, in, in Timbuktu were able to spread and establish all these Qadiriya schools. Tijaniya was relatively new, so Umar Tal, when he went to on pilgrimage to Mecca, he was it took 17 years to do this pilgrimage, but as part of that, he then become he becomes the named leader of the Tijaniya for West Africa, and he came back with the um, duty to spread the Tijaniya in West Africa. So, so that was a more of a new. Um, brotherhood in terms of West Africa, but the Qadiriya was the oldest brotherhood in West Africa. Um, so in terms of enslavement, and this is part of the reason why these um, reform movements, these revolutions, these um, happened, um, was that there had been um, in West, within Muslim West Africa, as consensus um, since about the 16th century that, um, that only non-Muslims could be enslaved through legal wars. Of course, the question is, who is a Muslim? <laughs> and what is a legal war? Okay, so that was the question. Um, there was also broad agreement that it was the responsibility of governments to protect the rights of freeborn Muslims. And this is the accusation that these um, leaders of these movements were accusing um, the, the governments of not fulfilling. So um, in the area that became the Sakota Caliphate, the main region, Hausa land, was at the time divided into many different city-states whose leadership says that they are Muslim, who claim to be Muslim, um, how they went to war with each other over basically control over trade routes, and they took people captive, and these captives were Muslim, and they were willing to sell these people into the slave trade. And this is what Uthman Ben Folio, who's the leader of 
the Sakota Jihad was complaining, right? If you are a Muslim, a Muslim leader of a Muslim state, you are supposed to be protecting freeborn Muslims from enslavement, even if they are your enemies. You can do other things with them, but you cannot enslave them. And, the, and so there was these complaints that these leaders of these um, houses city states were not doing enough to protect these individuals. There was also agreement that it was the owner who is responsible for proving someone is not a freeborn Muslim. However, this was great in theory, and um, policymakers and leaders recognized that it was great in theory, and they recognized that this was a problem in practice. Right? The preferred remedy, if you suspect that you might be in possession of a um, freeborn Muslim, is that you're supposed to let that person go and swallow the economic loss. However, people realized that only the most pious of people are going to be willing to do that. And this is where, again, ransoming comes in. So, especially in the Sakota Caliphate, they are going to establish funds and help organize the ransoming of individuals because they realized that um, the, even though um, a captor should just be letting this person go, they're not going to be willing to do that because they don't want to be to lose um, their money. Therefore, by helping to arrange the ransom of this individual, the captive is made free, and the captor um, is paid back, and the government has fulfilled its duty in ensuring the freedom of freeborn Muslims. So ransoming becomes this practical way of dealing with this issue. But the, 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 the main thing is that um, people should have been just released, but they realized that this was not a practical thing to do. Yeah. So, in terms of um, of the area that I'm talking about, I mostly work on the Sakota Caliphate. So, this is the region in 1785. Um, these are the houses, city states. The Sakota Jihad starts in Gobir and then spreads. Um, first in Hausaland and then in other regions. Um, this is the Sakota Caliphate in 1850. You can see it, it spreads a um, much greater region outside of Hausaland. It spreads, covers most of what's modern northern Nigeria into modern day Niger, um, over into Burkina Faso and the Central um, African Republic, um, and then down um, into um, um, Yoruba land in southern modern day south of Nigeria. Um, and so what in the 19th century in, in my work on ransom, I'm mostly working on the Scottish Caliphate and then also the Marian states, which are in modern day Mali. So for the Sakoto Caliphate, um, they viewed it as one of their duties to try to stop illegal enslavement. One of the ironies of the establishment of the Sakota Caliphate and also the Marian states is that slavery actually increases um, in, um, in this era. Uh, what the Sakota Caliphate was concerned about was trying to facilitate what they considered to be legal enslavement while trying to eradicate what they considered to be illegal enslavement and captivity. In terms of being able to um, deal with, with exports, they're actually pretty good. So in terms of the northern border, they put export checks on the border to check who was be, who's leaving the Sakota Caliphate. They did not, uh, as long as slaves were being sold into um, other Muslim territories, then they were okay with that. Um, they just wanted to make sure that people who were being exported were people who were could be legally enslaved, so they're very careful, they wanted to check that. Um, they put an end to the tr uh, selling slaves to the south into the transatlantic slave trade, um, because selling slaves into the transatlantic slave trade meant yeah, they're selling people outside the Dar al Islam, which um, goes against one of the justifications for enslavement, which is to introduce um, non-Muslims to Islam. If you sell them outside of the Dar es Salaam into the transatlantic slave trade, then obviously they're not going to be introduced to Islam. So they, they, they stopped that. But their main problem for the Sakota Caliphate was, was the internal slave trade. Um, this was, the Sakota Caliphate was the largest state in sub-Saharan um, 
Africa. It was a four month journey from east to west, two months journey from north to south, right? Very large state. And the problem was how do you deal with internal borders and borders checks? And so they realized that uh, people were being taken captive illegally and being sold illegally, people who they viewed as people that they should be protecting. And they realized that people were not just freely releasing these people. So again, the most practical way to deal with this problem was to help arrange ransoms. So they um, viewed the government as having a role in negotiating ransoms. So they would help establish mediators um, and provide mediators. And they also provided, were supposed to provide funds for paying ransoms. And this was a matter of debate. Um, there's a huge debate in the literature of amongst policymakers about who was responsible for paying ransoms. Should it be mostly um, the government? Is it a government responsibility to pay ransoms? Or is it a family's responsibility to pay ransoms? And there's basically all these government officials really wanted to put the onus for paying ransoms on private families. Um, they believe that they had a role and that, that there should be a fund that's established um, to pay the ransoms of poor good Muslims, but as much as possible they would try to shift that responsibility to families. Like I have correspondence where this one family is saying, well we've raised half of the ransom fee, can you not help pay the rest? And the near writes back and says, well, don't you have other relatives you can ask? Can't you do more to raise this ransom fee? Like, take a few more weeks. Like, you know, raise the ransom fee, right? So they're really trying not to pay. And it's interesting, um, and they're trying to justify not the government not paying through all sorts of different means um, and trying to use various scholars to pay to um, and scholarly debates um, in order and and what Pascal's have said to basically try to put this onus on um, on the families, but and but when it came down to it, they did cough up money when they really must, but they really tried to avoid it. Um, they tried to make sure that families paid as much of these ransoms as possible. Um, the other debate was on the prudency of of ransoming captives that they held. And so one of my best finds as a researcher was actually in the National Archives in Niger, where I found a letter written by Mohamed Bello, who was the second leader of the Sakota Caliphate, writing to the emir of, um, of, of Belgi, so Belgi's there. Um, and Lane, and this was a response to a letter that the Emir Belgi had written to him. And from the response, it's clear that the Emir Belgi was asking for advice on what to do with war captives that he was holding. And Mohamed Bello wrote back, uh, basically indicating um, that he should kill them that, um, and, and not allow their ransom. And, um, and what, what I found, and what's interesting about this, is that at the time, Belchi was r really insecure. So the emir, in terms of the leadership, was well secure. Um, he was well regarded. But this whole region was very loosely held. Um, it was on the front lines with the war against Bornu. Um, and so having to deal with, with fighting with Bornu. Um, also had a lot of raiding coming from this region, the Ningi region, into um, Belchi. And you had a lot of people within Belgi who did not want to be part of the Sakota Caliphate. So trying to hold on to power within Belgi was really difficult. So Mohamed Bello was saying, don't ransom these captives, don't send them back um, to where they came from, where they could cause more trouble, just kill them. Um, whereas uh, Adulahi, who was his, um, Mohamed Bello's uncle, who was the brother of uh, with Ben Folio, who's the founder of the Scotland Caliphate, who was the leader of the Scotland Jihad. So basically, these three men, um, with Menden Folio, uh, Folio, and Mohammed Bello, plus um, 
Uthman's daughter, um, Nana Asimu, were basically the kind of the four leaders of the Scotia Jihad and the Scotia and the Scotia Caliphate. And the Caliph and the early Scotia Caliphate. Um, Abdullahi, who who was well regarded in terms of jurisprudence, when he wrote he, um, to the to the new emirs and political leadership of Kano, which is here, um, which was one of the most important uh, areas in terms of economics, so the economic capital of, of the caliphate, well secured, uh, very solidly in the hands of the scholar caliphate. However, um, there's a lot of infighting within the political leadership of that particular emirate. The emir at the time was very unpopular, he was weak, lots of infighting. Abdullahi wrote, um, basically a treatise on jurisprudence called Diya al-Hakam, where he then kind of, as part of that, he outlined what are the proper procedures for dealing with a war captive, what are your, what are your options. And, and there he, he says that for is prefer, prefer is perfectly legitimate, that if you can get a good price for a prisoner, that you should allow that person to be ransomed. So, um, and, and the difference, I think, between the, the two advices that were being given, one by um, Abdullahi and one by Muhammad Bello, at around the same time, was because they're addressing this different audience. Um, Kano was well secured. It was um, there, there's no danger that that um, the Scotia Caliphate would lose Kano or that it would be conquered by 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 somebody else, and therefore you you, you could do. You can ransom back an enemy and without having too much of an issue. Whereas Belchi was very insecure, right? Lots of problems in Belchi, um, and therefore ransoming back enemy captives may not have been very prudent. So I think that's what um, what, what 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 was the difference between um, the, the advice that Abdullahi and Mohammed Bell were giving. Um, what we do know is that over time, um, ransom became even more popular, so you had a lot more enemy captives being ransomed back over time as the Scotia Caliphate became more secure in its borders. Um, in terms of ransom negotiations, um, factors in successes of ransom negotiations was obviously the willingness of the captor, right? The person holding that person captive had to be willing to enter the negoti negotiations. Um, the status of the captive was important. The vast majority of people who were ransomed are going to be um, high status captives um, whose family and friends are able to pay, even though the Scotia Caliphate supposedly had funds for to pay for the ransoms of poor good Muslims. Um, basically, it helped to be rich, okay, to be ransomed. Um, and also the role of the mediator. The Sokoto um, Caliphate provided mediators, um, usually um, various uh, civil servants to, um, um, to serve as mediators. Um, in non-Muslim regions, you had anybody who basically could hold the trust of both parties could serve as a mediator. But both the Amarians and the Scotia Caliphate would provide um, a, a government mediator um, on, on demand. Um, however, um, you do obviously have successful ransom negotiations, but a lot of ransom negotiations failed. Um, what you have is oftentimes if they were taking too long, then the captor would withdraw from the, or from the negotiations. The captor could always sell the captive, right? So. Um, if it's taking too long, um, if they feel that they're not going to get their money out of their investment, if it's too much to try to keep this person alive and healthy, et cetera, et cetera, they could always sell this person. Um, this agreement over price, so um, if you cannot come to an agreement about the price of ransom, um, negotiations would fail, and um, the captain could always sell that person to save trade. Um, obviously, when family and friends can't raise um, the ransom fees and can't raise them in time. So I do have um, letters of where people were just too late in terms of, of, of raising the ransom fees and can't get the ransom fees um, in time. Um, you also have disputes with mediators. Um, sometimes mediators got 
um, frustrated or upset or um, and this is especially with when you're using a non-government mediator um, who because mediators are also are going want to pay, be paid they're investing their time they're investing sometimes they're taking um, risks right in terms of these negotiations um, and so those types of issues plus just personality disputes if, it, if the mediator pulls out, then the rest negotiation would often fail. Also sometimes, um, not in the Sakota Caliphate, but especially in other regions in West Africa, such as Yoruba land, sometimes, <coughs> um, uh, sometimes when the government will disallow a ransom negotiation. Um, and so when, when that happens, then, um, then, 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 then people, then, then they fail. So the reason why captors would be willing to ransom instead, yeah? I, I wanted to ask a question mm -hmm. about how they set the price for the ransom. I I'm get about to get, yes. Okay, okay yeah, so, so basically, ransoms, <laughs> there we go, okay. Um, so what, the reason why ransom, uh, uh, captors are willing to ransom is that usually you can get at least twice the price um, ransoming the person back, and then you can by selling that person on the slave trade. So the minimum is basically twice the price, and often more. So especially if you have a more high status captive, the price goes up. Like I have um, prices for one elite woman, her ransom was 18 slaves. Um, so uh, so these so that that's what keeps the captors' interest. So um, is that they're going to get a higher payout, but um, it takes more work, right? You have to keep the person alive, you have to keep the person secure, you have to enter these negotiations. These negotiations can take months, right? Um, there's a lot of back and forth, right? A lot of issues. And so, um, but the payout is going to be better. Yeah. Was there incentive to misrepresent who you were as a captive in order to decrease the price that you would have your family pay? So there are studies of Barbary pirates and ransoming, yeah. where um, I think there's a narrative about some kind of like delay will lead to higher prices because they're holding out for more money for higher status captives. Um, so how does the how does the ransomer determine what that value should be? Like, do they assess the person in some way, or do they test the market, or? Well, and, and this is the issue because especially like, um, and, and so like, there, there is a lot of literature in the Mediterranean where, 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 where people who are about to be taken captive, right, they want to uh, portray themselves as wealthy enough to be worthy of ransom, <laughs> but not so wealthy that the ransom price is going to be so high, right? And so how, how do you indicate that? Um, what I find, uh, like the status definitely, the higher the status, the higher the ransom price go, goes up. Um, and so you have, I have cases of members who are members of, the, of, of royal families, they are known, the price is high, they're not going to be able to disguise that. Um, so, um, but usually if you're just kind of like a normal non-royal person, um, your ransom is going to be at least twice. So this is going to be easier, the more money wealthy come from, that's easier to, to, to raise. But you have a lot of, say, poorer people who are um, coming from uh, more, um, you know, lower means, who are, said, who are trying to raise these ransom fees, who are, like, who are trying to raise, like, oh, the whole extended families involved in trying to raise, to raise the ransom fees. So the minimum that somebody's going to be let go at is going to be twice the price, and if they can get more, they're going. They're going to be asking for more. But yes, the status of a person's personal status, and if that's known, that's going to play into it. But what's also interesting is that these prices basically stay stable even um, even across genders. So, for, uh, in women, slaves are more expensive in Africa than male slaves. Women were more valued as slaves for both their productive ability and their reproductive ability. So, because they were the workers, they're the, they're the ones who know how to plant and all that type of stuff, plus um, they, they could bear children. And so, the ransom price for women was 
still twice what they would fetch on, 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 on the slave market. So it's more actually more expensive to ransom a woman than it was to ransom a man, oftentimes. But it's the it's um, but this this person, this Medin, um, and it's funny because I, I didn't realize it until um, after I wrote the first draft and got this kind of note from one of my um, advisors because I made a big deal out of the fact that this ransom of fourteen oxen, six cows, and two pieces of guinea cloth was for a very was for an old and sick man, and I made this like. Well, can you imagine that this is a ransom price for an old and sick man that's being demanded from from his wife? And like you know, obviously the wife really, really loved this guy. She's going to you know raise fourteen oxen, and my older um, person on my committee was like, yeah. <laughs> he was like, I was like, oh yeah, you're an older man. <laughs> you know, things that you when you're younger you shouldn't be saying, right? Um, but he's like, maybe de-emphasize the old and <laughs> the old and sick aspect of this man, okay? Um, but it's definitely playing right on these emotional ties that, that, people, that people have. Um, so like one of the problems with um, researching ransoming in West Africa is that you don't have the same number of narratives that you get out of uh, Mediterranean captives. Now, even though the Mediterranean captives, the, the narratives that you have are coming from elites, Cap captives who are able to write things down, um, and most of these narratives are men, but you don't have the same um, sources for West Africa. Like, there's a couple of biographies um, that, that you use, like Barbara Caro, like she, she wrote her biography that included uh, a discussion about the ransom negotiation for her, for her uncle's wife, um, wife and, and, and children. Um, but for the most part, most of my sources in terms of ransom prices are coming from oral sources. They're coming, um, actually the French, um, from in, in the early days of French presence, they wrote a lot about what they observed. And so they would, and when they heard about ransom cases, they would write the information that they know. So we're not, so I don't, we don't have the same kind of um, uh, information from the captive's point of view about how they are playing it. We do actually, that's not true, there is one, um, so this guy, um, Muhammad Bakrapa, who had the most unfortunate luck, um, he was a trader, he was a merchant, and he was taken captive three times. Um, the first time, his he was, so his brother technically bought him because his brother was able to find him, pretended that he did not know him, and was able to purchase him, therefore paid a slave price for him instead of a ransom price, because if the relationship had been known, then he would have, then the price would have gone up, right? Um, so there their plan is like, we we'll pretend that we don't know each other and all, and, and the brother bought him back. Um, the second time he was taken captive, he was out and out ransomed, and the third time he ended up on a slave ship to the Americas, and then later on he writes his biography once he gets freed from slavery. But he also writes about how, as he was being brought closer to the coast, he um, was he wrote about when he finally lost hope because at all this time he was trying to send out messages, trying to like tell people that he's there, that what's happening to him, hoping to arrange his ransom, and. Um, then he reached a certain point and he realized, okay, now I'm stuck. Like, like this is, I'm really in trouble now because past this point, I don't have any contacts and this is not going to be good. And this, so, and so we don't have very much from the, from, 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 from the captive's point of view in terms of answering those questions. Uh, I'm trying to visualize, is this, is this so prevalent that everybody knows somebody who's been a captive or people are living in fear? Because I, I was thinking this was well, war prisoners, but when we're talking about women from ruling families, uh, these are very targeted kidnappings. So. No, well, women were part of warfare. So, so yeah, so that, that woman was kidnapped. So you do have kidnappings. Like I said, 90% of the people who were enslaved uh, who are enslaved are, are war captives. But women were also part of that because Men did the fighting, but in, but women were the support columns. So women were setting up camp, they're cooking, they're fetching water, they're providing medical care, 
and along with that come along with them comes children and their camps were often attacked so so women were also prisoners of war and this was like a constant part of life or was this in well, this, certain periods of um, intense conflict well, the, 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 so like the period that i'm talking about is a period of, of intense conflict because you if you go back to, to my map so especially the 19th century was a period of um because all of this took was took place because of conflict i see um and so this is part of why um slavery also expands um is because more people are being taken captive, and then what do you do with a captive, right? Um, and you can, one of the things they can do with them is, is sell them as a slave. You also, also what happens in the Skoda Caliphate is that once they conquer a region and kind of establish themselves, then they kind of, they, they stop the, the, the petty warfare that was going on. So these city states, these aren't really all that big, uh, but there's a lot of um, small wars over trade routes which was not good for agriculture because um, a lot of the fighting took place on agricultural land. When the Scottish Caliphate was established, it, it established like, you know, a very peaceful agricultural situation where people could, you know, could grow things and, and there was a demand for, for enslaved labor in, in terms of that, which was provided um, through this expansion of the Scottish Caliphate. So the 19th century was, was, a, was a period of of a lot of conflict going going on um, between Sachin of the Caliphate plus also the Marian states in different regions. So you had this increase in captives. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> so just to finish up, um, so and when taking somebody captive, um, the decision to release the person, sell, sell the person, kill the person, exchange, or ransom, ransom the prisoner, right, is really based on uh, the captors and their society's weight that they place on variables of interpretation of law, like what is legal, um, and the interpretation of law that they're using, um, the, the view of past regional nightmare practices, um, prudency, and also cash and labor needs. And these, factors went into the decision making in terms of past ransom negotiations in the historical period and I argue are also um, at play in contemporary ransom negotiations um, and dealing with captives, especially when you're talking about the insurgency going on in, um, um, in, um, especially in, in Central Sudan or across the Sahel region in general. So if you're looking at, for example, um, taking two cases that I think are kind of famous, the Shabak kidnapping um, from 2014 and the Dachi kidnappings from 2018. Um, part of the reason I, I, I chose to put um, this photograph up. So this is Mary Katambi. She's one of the released Shibak girls. She was, um, so about half of the Shibak girls have been either released, ransomed, escaped um, somehow. Um, I don't like showing pictures of them um, from the um, videos that Shakal put out, uh, basically it's the worst day of their lives. I don't, I try not to use those types of, of pictures. So there's Mary Katambi, um, who was one of these um, girls who was kidnapped um, from Shibak in 2014 um, at her university graduation from American University of Nigeria in um, 2021. Um, but in looking, when, when Shakal, um, when these girls were kidnapped, Right, um, Chicago put out a video saying that I'm either going to um, enslave them or ransom them. Right, so if you offer me, or, or, or exchange them. So if you offer me money, if you will give exchange them for um, Boko Haram prisoners that, that Nigeria is holding, um, then we can exchange. And if you don't do that, then I'm going to going to enslave them. And um, then you and then you look just so that with. The Dachi students, which is because um, most of the um, Shibak girls were not Muslims, um, but most of the, of the girls who were kidnapped from, from Dachi in 2018 from the government school in Dachi were Muslims. And all of them were released except for the one Christian girl. And um, Jacob Zen argues that the reason why they were released 
was because um, um, they were being held by ISWAP, which was affiliated with the Islamic State, and the Islamic State said to release them. I argue it um, differently. I, I argue that they were released because they were recognized as Muslims, that ISWAP recognized them as Muslims. Um, there, there were Muslims who were kidnapped from Shibak, but Boko Haram was not, was not um, recognized as, as, as Muslim girls. I argue that the Dachi girls were, were released because ISWAP was recognized that they were Muslims and that they should not be you know, in, in, enslaving um, uh, Muslim girls, and that's why they released them. They released the girls that they viewed as Muslim, and they did not release the one girl who was, was not a Muslim. Um, so, but all of this, but past and present, right, looking back at uh, whether what you're going to do with a war, war prisoner is based on the captor's interpretation of law, their view of past regional um, ransom practices. Shakal makes a big used to make a big deal out of the fact that ransoming was a widely practiced practice in the region. Um, prudency, whether or not it's a good idea in terms of um, your own strategy, whether or not this is a good idea, and then also cash and labor needs. Do you want the money? Right, that this captive can give you, or do you need them for labor? Um, certainly, um, the Sonata Caliphate had use for enslaved labor. Um, and also, uh, Boko Haram either um, also has, has use for, for enslaved labor. So do they want the cash, do they want the labor? Yeah, so, um, I, so that's one of the connections that I make between the past and the present. And I guess I'm done in 45 minutes. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. I guess you stimulated already the, the discussion. I will take the privilege that I have now as the moderator um, to ask, uh, well, at least one question that I had in mind uh, even before when reading one of your articles about the, the tribal solidarities, uh, solidarities that may have exist uh, at the time in this region um, because of the imposition of the Muslim state. I was just wondering how this might have shadowed or activated or reactivated some tribal uh, tensions or, or maybe ethnic uh, grouping in the region. Yeah, so going back. Come back to that. So, um, for, in terms of the Scottish Jihad, it starts off in Hausaland. And one of the interpretations of the Scottish Jihad is that it was a ethnic movement, that it was the Fulani against the Hausa. So, mm -hmm. the Fulani were more rural, they um, were pastoralists, and the Hausa were more urban farmers, and they were in charge. And, and looking at this, um, movement, um, like people are saying, well, look, it's mostly Fulani who are involved in this. However, when you look at a lot of the leadership and, the, and also people who joined, it was actually multi-ethnic. Um, and even the leaders, um, one of the big influences on the Fendant Folio was actually, his, uh, one of his, was a Tuareg scholar who, who actually said, well, um, I would have led this movement, however, God told me it should be left to to Uthman. So you know, so like, and and he was a huge, um, huge, huge influence on that. Um, so like you, so I argue, I stand on the side that's not really an ethnic movement because when you look at who joined, you had people from all sorts of ethnicities who joined. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that you had a lot of people who joined the movement for other reasons than religion. Now, obviously, um, Uthman Folio had wanted to establish a state based on his particular interpretation of Maliki law and the Qadiriya Sufi Brotherhood. Um, and however, most of his students, uh, who were most, the most believers in that message, um, they died really quickly. It turns out that students are not the best at fighting. Okay? <laughs> and they, so these students kind of got wiped out, the ones who are more like ideologically aligned with Infant and Folio. And you had a lot of people who joined 
um, for a variety of reasons. A lot of economic people, it was, it was a job, or they're looking for new territory, stuff like that. And this was actually one of the complaints when the Scottish Caliphate was initially established. So, so Abdullahi, like, he was, this is one of his complaints. This is part of the reason why I wrote um, the treatise that I wrote for the political leadership of Kano, because his complaint was, you are not governing the way you're supposed to govern. This is the law, I'm writing to you, this is how you, these are your options in the, all these different situations. This, this is your, these are your legal options, do this. And he almost, he even threatened that he's just gonna give up and move to Mecca. That's what he said, it's like, I'm just gonna, you know, you guys are hopeless, I'm gonna move to Mecca. Um, and so there's a, like a lot of complaints about that people were not um, be, behaving properly. And part of it had to do also with how the, the the, the Sikhot Catholic was more of a confederation than a federation. So what Luthman did is that he would give these flags to different leaders to then and then go off and they had the right to go off and conquer a certain region. So so Adamawa um, here, um, right? So this guy is named after this guy named Adam. Um, he like so Luthman and Boda gave him a flag and basically to he's affiliated and was able to go and conduct you know, jihad in his name and then establish it. But like basically he's the guy who, who established his his um, the territory there. And so he's allowed he's he's aligned, but it's more of you know um, an intellectual alignment. It's more basically on the prestige of Uthman Danfodio and and Abdullahi and Muhammad Bello that a lot of these people, that a lot of these emirates you know, owed allegiance to Sokoto. So the leadership in Sokoto had to be really careful because they had to try to, they had to balance these different interests of the different emirates with what they really want to establish because if they push too hard, then somebody might just decide to say, you know what, we don't really owe allegiance to you um, mm -hmm. at all. So you had, um, you had that effect. Actually, the Caliphate of Hamdullahi did exactly that. So initially, the founder of the Caliphate of Hamdullahi, he took a flag from Sokoto um, and um, was supposed to be under um, the aegis of Sokoto. And then when they had the leadership crisis in Sokoto between Abdullahi and Muhammad Bello, who would take, who would take over when, when Uthman died, Muhammad Bello won that. But um, Hamdullahi took um, that opportunity to separate and say, oh, we're, I no longer owe allegiance to Sokoto. Um, so they, 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 had, they had to balance things. Yeah. How legitimate was the fear that uh, people would, uh, these, these hostages would be radicalized and come back and attack the, their, their captives or um, become part of a, a movement of a territory uh, surrounding that might attack that territory. I think you mentioned that you said this was a fear of one of the captors and that's why he didn't think it was prudent to allow prisoners of war to be, uh, to live. Yeah, well, like, it's, it's, so so this is in Belgium. So, um, so when they were, for example, taking, like, Bornu captives, right, to, in the fighting that they're holding Bornu, you say, well, we don't want to ransom them back to Bornu because these, they are just turn around and, and maybe attack us again, right? So, so they're, they're concerned that, um, that, you know, why, why release soldiers who can then come and fight us again? Like, that's a bad idea, right? We're, we're, we're currently in a war, right? Like, so, so we shouldn't do that. Yeah, so that was like, the concern there. But were they allowed to be uh, released elsewhere, or they were just killed? Or um, well, I don't know what happened to them. Um, because like I just had this letter, but basically in this letter, um, Muhammad Bello was, don't release them, don't, don't ransom them, um, what you should do is kill them. That's, that's what he was advising. So what actually happened to the prisoners, I don't know, but Muhammad Bello was saying, in this case, do not ransom them, kill them. Yeah. I have a question that I know is beyond the scope, but I wonder during the period of the Islamic State, was there any discussion about ransoming, like Yazidis who were taken? by the Islamic State? Was there any discourse about how to handle that situation? 
I have absolutely no idea. I was just curious <laughs> because it would be a subject of um, maybe some discussion at that time, but I don't remember hearing anything about ransoming. Like there was a lot of discussion about enslavement. Yeah. Um, but not, and because the Islamic State did not consider Yazidis to be Muslims, that was considered, that was a justification that they used. But I didn't see ransoming as an option. And you make it sound like it's a Pareto improving kind of outcome for everybody. It's better for the captive. It's better for the um, person who holds the slave. And it's better for you know kind of the government because they don't have to deal with this problem. So the ransom is the the, the prudent Pareto improving outcome for all relevant parties, which I totally buy. But then we would expect it to come up in all cases of enslavement. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know. Um, cause, but then it comes down to that cash and labor need, um, need. Ca need yeah. right? So because there, like IS had a use for, especially for women, right? Yeah. Um, as, 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 um, as slaves, right? There, there's a bit, there was a demand for, for enslaved women, right? So as labor, so either you're talking about manual labor or sex work, right? There's, there's this demand. Um, and it's the same thing with, so what, what's a greater demand, right? Um, the money, mm -hmm. right? Or, or, or the labor, mm -hmm. right? You've kind of had this um, issue like in terms of Mediterranean slavery too, right? You had um, what's, talk a lot about um, Europeans being held in, in North Africa and then the discussion about labor and and cash, but when you look at uh, North Africans um, being held in Europe, but hardly any ransoms take place at all. It's not because like North Africans weren't interested in ransoming it, but just that Europeans were not releasing them. They were being held because the labor was was demanded in terms of galley labor was was where most North Africans um, ended up being enslaved, right? Um, so, so again, it comes it comes down to 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 what's more. Now there is a demand for for um, women in um, both Bagram and Iswa, um, in in, ter in in terms of, of marriage, like one of the recruitment um, ways for in, for recruitment in Bagram is that they promise these young men that they would be able to get a wife, um, and so you do have women who voluntarily join Bagram, but then um, you you have all these 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 kidnapped women. Um, and and so there is that that demand too, but they also want money. So mm -hmm. so it come, comes comes for that. Yeah. Is there any more questions? Well, thank you very yeah. much. Thank you, Heidi.